welcome to RC Video Magazine's first issue. We're a new format magazine produced on video cassette, consisting of programming dedicated to the RC hobby. In our first issue, we'll be taking you to Ida Grove, Iowa, home of Byron Originals, first annual fan fly. From there to Washington, D.C. to talk with Doug Pratt about four-stroke engines. Next, we will return again to Iowa and the 10th annual SIG IMAC Championship, sponsored by the SIG Manufacturing Company and organized by Des Moines RC Club. Then on to Reno, Nevada for the 1984 NAT Scale Soaring Competition. From there, we go to the East Coast, where Jeff Troy shares his building tips, and then to California, where John Simone talks about flying model helicopters. <laughs> Welcome to the 1984 Fanfly here in Ida Grove, Iowa, home of Byron Originals. Byron Godberson opens his backyard to pilots and spectators who have come from all over the United States and Canada. The facilities are the finest, with a 600-foot concrete runway equipped with radar for aircraft speed detection. F-86 H model. It was built prior to the show for the ducted fan fly. We are uh, doing a Korean War dogfight with these airplanes. We have two H's and one D and three MiGs. Uh, the airplane was basically constructed in three weeks prior to the show. It has uh, the sequencing gear door kit. There is no uh, flaps or slats, although it does have speed brakes that actuate by control of the sixth channel. The airplane weighs in at uh, 11 and a half pounds and uses the Rossi 81 for power. Estimated speed flat and level would probably be somewhere in the vicinity of 125 to 130. And it's a uh, fiberglass fuselage. The wings are a conic coated foam and the entire airplane was sanded with uh, Scotch Bright, which is a 3M product prior to the final decal laying. At this all-ducted fan contest, trophies were awarded for fastest jet, slowest jet, shortest takeoff, most vertical rolls, and pilot's choice.
is Dean Copeland here, event director with the Byron Originals 1984 first annual fly-in here at Ida Grove, Iowa. Flying at the new facilities, uh, the all-concrete 600-foot runway. I handle promotion work for Byron Originals, PR work, and I'm sitting in one of our prototype uh, PR-type aircraft that's used for demonstrating our fans and so forth. This plane is 10 foot 3 inches long and is driven by two Rossi 81 engines driving the Birojet ducted fans. This plane weighs 34 pounds. The plane you see earlier in the tape is the all black plane that was flown for demonstration here in front of the group. This plane is painted in the Nassau color scheme for test purposes. <laughs> The talented Byron original staff entertained the crowd with World War II and Korean air battles. Let's go back to 1944 and watch the battle between American and Japanese air power in the South Pacific. It was determined by the Allied forces that Japan itself would have to be bombed heavily prior to any climatic invasion. The United States forces hoped to work toward this goal by occupying Luzon in the Philippines and Formosa. In March 1944, it was decided to take those islands where the United States had suffered such humiliating defeats. By the end of 1944, thousands of square miles of contested waters had been reconquered. You are about to witness a recreation of one such attack on a Pacific island.
Hi, I'm Doug Pratt, and I'm going to talk a little bit about four cycle engines. What I want to do is give you an overview of the details of the different types of engines that are available, uh, and pretty much the whole spectrum. I don't get into heavy mechanical details, metallurgy, castings, this sort of thing, because I don't really have the expertise to tell these things anyway. And uh, I don't think that a lot of that information is really practical. What I do want to show you and tell you is what you can expect from these engines, how they operate, how they compare with what you might be familiar with. Four strokes are a coming thing. The market has exploded within the last two or three years. There's been a tremendous increase in the number of engines available since uh, OS came out with the OS four stroke 60 uh, back about five or six years ago. And uh, that engine itself has since been replaced by a new engine, the 61, which leads us into the OS engines. I have my OS 40 installed in my little champ over here. Uh, the OS four cycles, since they were the first ones on the market, uh, they were involved in a great deal of development. And as a result, they don't share a lot of characteristics between the different engines. Uh, they're very, they widely differ in how much power they put out. But the OS design philosophy is to give you an engine that handles as close to a two-cycle engine as possible. In other words, something that you're familiar with. They do not require special fuels as a rule, as a general rule. The handling, the needle valve setting is quite wide. Break-in is nothing special. You treat them pretty much like you would treat a, a two-cycle engine. The only difference is that they really need their special glow plug. Uh, the plug is kind of expensive. Uh, I believe they cost somewhere around four or five dollars a piece uh, because of the precious metals that are needed in the element. But they do last a long time, and if you buy a couple of them, you'll be ahead of the game. You'll improve the idling characteristics. That's about the only variance in the OS engines. Now, the 40 is a good meat and potatoes engine. It's been very reliable for me in the, in the year or so that I've been running it. Uh, it was not necessary to set the idle on the engine at all. It's still at the factory setting. You tinker with the needle valve a little bit for the particular prop that you've got on the high end, and uh, it runs just like a two-cycle. They're also very quiet. They're one of the quieter engines. Uh, they don't always develop the same total power that an equivalent displacement engine of a different brand will. Uh, now, in the case of the new 61 that I mentioned, uh, all bets are off because that's a very high technology engine, brand new, designed as a direct replacement for an engine that was the first popularly available four-stroke on the market. And that is an extremely powerful engine, has a very high power to weight ratio. Speaking of which, uh, people ask me about direct comparisons between two cycles and four cycles. and in a sense, that's a real trap. You can get into some real trouble trying to make direct comparisons. Uh, lean toward the safe side. I am a little conservative, I'll admit. I run my engines a little rich. Uh, so I try to lean toward an, in, an airplane that's designed for uh, 20 to a 35. We'll generally fly with most of the 44 cycles. An airplane designed for an 09 to a 15 would fly fine with a 21 or a 34 cycle. Uh, just use judgment. We'll look at the manufacturer's recommended weights. This is crucial information, and they'll be able to uh, they'll be able to give you a good lead. I mentioned the 30. This is a Sato 30. Now we're talking about characteristics of particular engines. I find the Sato's to be the friendliest running engines I've ever played with. These guys are conventionally laid out, solidly built, a little heavier than equivalent displacement engines from other manufacturers. But the handling characteristics are wonderful. I have a Sato 45 in my Stinson Reliant that we'll look at later on. And that is a beautiful, beautiful handling engine. Utterly unpicky as to fuel. I'm using k and hot glow plugs, no problem. Fox glow plugs also work well. Just avoid the idle bar plugs because uh, you have such high compression in four cycles. Generally speaking, the idle bar will not clear the top of the piston. So if you use a standard plug, Fox or K&B, the Sato's handle them beautifully. Uh, the Sato's are not quite as powerful as some of the four cycles that you can buy, but the handling characteristics, I think, outweigh that substantially. 
And if you need every last ounce of power that the engine is providing, you ought to have built a lighter airplane. This Sato 30 has exposed valve covers, uh, which makes it a little bit easier to work on. The 40, the 45 all have rocker arm covers. Uh, the 30 is unique in a lot of ways. I've spent a lot of time experimenting with this engine. It has a pressure takeoff on the exhaust pipe. Not absolutely essential to pressurize unless you have an installation in a scale model where you want to mount the tank off the center line or away from the center line of the carburetor. Now this carburetor is attached by a bolt on the bottom that comes from a leaf on the back of the crankcase. You can loosen that, remove that bolt, and swing this carburetor up so it's sticking out like this. And that is really nifty for some installations. I had, one, I had this engine in an Ace Air Scout. Flew it for years that way. Of course, if you tried to roll that plane to inverted, you'd flood the engine out. So you have to be a little careful of that sort of an installation. But there are some places, especially in a cowled-in scale model, where that would work beautifully. Now, I have a kind of an odd prop on this engine, and thereby hangs another tail. This prop is a Grish Brothers 3-blade 8.8. Now, an 8.8 is a weird prop. Uh, there can't be a whole lot of applications for an 8.8 prop. But this little engine hums along beautifully on it. For some reason or other, this just happens to like that extra pitch. And generally speaking, the extra torque that a four-stroke engine produces means that you can use wider, deeper-pitched props. Scale modelers love it because it comes closer to looking like the real thing. Now, I've talked a little bit about relative power. And so far, the engines I've talked about don't come close to the equivalent two-cycle. A four-cycle 60 doesn't come anywhere near a two-cycle 60. One that does come anywhere near is the Enya. The Enya engines, uh, I have owned and run all of them. And I find that, generally speaking, they are the powerhouses. These engines are high compression, high technology engines. They will turn big props. They are a little pickier as to fuel. This is where using four-stroke fuel as opposed to standard two-stroke two fuel makes a big difference. This Enya 60, at the time I tested it, had the highest brake horsepower per unit of weight of any engine I've ever played with. It is a very powerful engine. It has flown a 10-pound airplane, a 10-pound super sweet stick, which is a plane with plenty of wings. So don't take this out and put it in a 10-pound scale model with a small wing. But the Enya 60 will fly any 8, 9-pound airplane easily. The Enyas in general, the 35 and the 40, which were the first engines, the first four-stroke engines that Enya came out with, were very high compression engines. The 35 particularly had a hand-lapped piston. Took a long time to break in, never wears out, but it took a long time to break in. Uh, break in is another subject that we should get into, but let me stick with the Enyas for a second. The 35 and the 40 are still available some places, but they're no longer being manufactured. The 90, the 60, the 120, and the new 46 are all the new layout engines. They're much easier to handle than the 35 and the 40 were. They're ringed engines so that they don't require quite as much break-in, easier to adjust, generally friendlier. They do have choke valves on them. Uh, they have the standard Enya carburetor with an air bleed adjustment for the idle, which I prefer because it's a lot wider and a lot simpler, generally easier to work with. However, since they have a higher output, you pay for that. They're a little louder. Sometimes you might want to use a muffler on these. I use this particular engine unmuffled because I fly at a field where there are quite a few other people flying. And you run into an interesting problem when you're flying four strokes. If there's anybody else in the air, you can't hear whether your engine's running or not. So by leaving the muffler off it, I bring the noise back up a little bit, and I have a little bit more to work with in that direction. In any case, we'll talk a little bit more about Enya's, specifically the 46, which is an outstanding engine. Whether you're just starting or an experienced pro, you'll find Great Plains makes a quality kit for you. For learning, you can't beat a trainer 20, 40, or 60. They are easy building kits designed to get you to that first takeoff quickly. During training, your instructor will reduce the throttle for slow, stable, and responsive flight. After soloing, our symmetrical airfoil allows high-speed flight without trim changes. 
even aerobatics. Our Sportster 40, 60, and 40 bike designs are a perfect blend of performance with style. And now kits come complete with four cycle conversion plans so your Sportster can sound as good as it looks. The Chaos designs were perfected in competition so they're fast and groovy flyers. Four point rolls, inverted flight, Immelmans, figure M's, a Chaos will do them all. They're easy to build kits that are light for their size so landings are nice and slow. Experienced modelers will love our 72-inch span Cap 21. It's an accurate scale design that is incredibly aerobatic with a snurl 60 or 124 stroke. If you have a 40-size engine, think about installing it in one of our realistic new designs. The Cherokee 40 flies like a sport model but looks like a real plane. Flap hardware is included to add a new dimension to flying fun. And our plane will even do mild stunts such as this spin, just like the full-size Cherokee. For breathtaking maneuvers with a 40-powered scale plane, there's our new Cap 2140. Point rolls, knife edge loops, hammerheads, they're all possible with this superb performer. Lightweight balsa construction, coupled with a Snurl 40 engine, will give great vertical performance. Just watch this plane climb. Snap rolls are literally a snap. And best of all, our cap lands like a trainer. That's because it's a great plane. See them at your dealers today. One other very nice feature about the Enyas, they have an extra point that gives them a little added versatility. If you need the high power of these high compression engines, you have it. But most of the modern ones now come with an extra head gasket. If you want to swing a larger, lower pitched propeller, or if you find that you're having some trouble with your specific fuel, if you're getting props that kick off, or you're having a little bit of difficulty with uh, running it too lean, with having it backfire, or having it start hard, you remove the head bolts, you put the gasket on, put the head bolts back on, reset the valves, and you'll calm down the engine. If the power, if you need the power, it's there. But having that extra head gasket, and uh, in some cases, I found that I've run the engine flat out, put it in a couple of different airplanes, and then had an, air, had an airplane project that required an engine of a completely different character. Stick the head valve in that well-broken in Enya, turns it into a different engine. It's a very, very good feature of the Enyas. On June 16th and 17th, 1984, we went to Montezuma, Iowa, where the 10th Annual SIG IMAC Championships were held. They were sponsored by SIG Manufacturing Company and organized by the Des Moines RC Club. Sig Hester and Maxie Hester took a few moments to talk with us. Learned to fly and had a license to fly before I ever had a license to drive a car. It was my, my first driver's license was restricted to motorcycle. came here 
visitors from New Zealand, wasn't he? And I took him for a ride, and he wrote back and said, was telling people that I flew so low, he was able to milk the cows. When I started in RC in 1954, I started that year, and uh, the first thing I did was go with some of the guys to a contest. And uh, the, all it amounted to was spot landing. Well, I won it. <laughs> it was my first year, and so after that, I was really hepped up on contests, and then I started pushing, putting on contests at Des Moines all the time I was there. So when I came down here then, well, it was just natural to uh, promote contests. That promotes modeling, all the contests you put on. It, it, it uh, gets the public out there, the spectators. Maybe you get one out of a hundred that'll go into a hobby shop and start modeling. And... Maxie tells, has told me about when he first started to fly model, what it was like to go out to the field and you launched it, and it went out there and crashed. And you took it home, and during the week, you repaired it. And the next weekend, you'd go out there, and you'd launch it, and go out there and crash. And how long almost, was it? I did that almost a year. Every weekend, it would just, I'd just you know, throw it out there, and it'd hit the ground and crash. Radio didn't work. So that's when, uh, see, I bought a, well, Berkeley Air Troll, but it didn't ever work. It never did work. So I got a schematic, and. Uh, got my own. Hi, I'm Holly Wayne from Longmont, Colorado. I'm flying here at the SIG contest and uh, I'm flying a uh, Yak 18 p.m. This plane was reused by the Russians in an aerobatic competition uh, for many years, and uh, Claude McCullough from the SIG factory designed this airplane as a scale model and flew it in the International uh, Aerobatic Championship. This is a model that SIG produced for a few years and is now obsolete, but uh, it's kind of an old kit that's been laying around for years, the one that I have here. I've been bringing it to SIG for about seven years, flying it here, and uh, it's a real good, slow-flying airplane. It's got very light wing loading, powered by a Super Tiger 60, an old blue head engine that I've got had around for about 15 years, and we've placed fairly well here at this particular contest. This is a fairly old kit. So it's uh, built entirely of balsa wood. It doesn't use any of the new modern things like the, the plastics or the uh, uh, styrofoams that we use in the kits of today. This kit is all, all balsa wood. It's covered with uh, silk, the old-fashioned way, and it's also covered with butyrate dope, which is really, it's really pretty old, uh, old uh, way of, of uh, building airplanes. Today, most of the planes are covered with hobby epoxy type paints or epoxy finishes, but this is a butyrate dope that's used on full-scale aircraft. Clayton Toms took a few minutes to talk with us about this fine sport biplane. Well, I never, uh, I never had a biplane in my life. I always wanted a biplane, so I decided that I didn't want too small of a biplane. So I thought I'd decide for about a quarter scale size. So 
One morning I decided to start drawing up what I might like. And I uh, looked over to Christian Eagle and I looked over to Sig Sky, the uh, Dean Sky Bolt. And I looked over to Little Tooth. And finally, I, uh, out of about the whole three, I come up with this configuration, about this size, and I want something that would handle about a three or four horsepower engine. So I uh, went ahead and drew this size up and figured out the ailerons and uh, the distance uh, I wanted to, for good maneuverability in the uh, moments. And uh, kind of kept my fingers crossed and went on through it and watched every little uh, piece of structure and weight. And here I come up with a, with a well, if you want to call it a rainbow hawk. I usually fly 60 aircraft, and I thought this would be pretty good size for me to try to fly, so I thought I'd get a pretty well experienced pilot. He looked at it and said, let's try it. Hi, my name is Albert Kretz. I was privileged to be able to fly this airplane for the builder at the SIG contest this year. It's his own design. It's the Rainbow Hawk. It's 65 inch span. It's powered by a quarter 50 with a 20 inch prop. Uh, I only had one practice flight on this before I came up here, but this plane is so solid, it tracks so well and stops so precise that it's a, uh, it's a joy to fly. It's covered with fabric coat. It's uh, painted with uh, Sig Skybright paint. And it has a very good power to weight ratio and for a, a, a sport bike or uh, all around fun airplane, I'd highly recommend it for anybody because it's an excellent airplane. All in all, I'm absolutely pleased with the aircraft. I want to raise the I want to raise the landing gear about another inch to give a little more prop clearance. Uh, and I'm going to change the landing gear over to a aluminum over to aluminum uh, landing gear instead of the steel quarter inch steel wire landing gears that I have now. The next Hawk will have a, a pair of wheel pants on. At most contests, there is usually a plane or two that doesn't make it back home in exactly the same condition that it arrived in. And that was certainly the case with John Carney's pit special. Winners of this IMAC contest were in the category of open sportsmen. First place, Bob Keenan. Second place, Roger Bocox. In advanced open, first place, Bernice Fields. Second, Fred Hewlin. In unlimited open, first place was John Britt, and second place, Darrell Gideon. In giant scale were Bernice Fields and second, Don Heeren.
Academy of Model Aeronautics. The Academy is the national organization for people who build and fly model airplanes. The Academy's home is the National Center for Aero Modeling, the only building of its kind in the world. The center houses the Academy's offices, a visitor center, a library, and the National Model Airplane Museum. It's open to everyone. AMA members come to see historic models and use the library. When you join the Academy, you receive $2 million worth of liability and accident insurance, a subscription to Model Aviation Magazine, and a license that allows you to compete in sanctioned competition. But more important, you become part of the largest sport aviation organization in the world. You and almost 100,000 other AMA members are part of the effort that brings us more flying fields, more frequencies, and more of the respect that our sport deserves. Be a part of it. Write to us at the Academy of Model Aeronautics, 1810 Samuel Morse Drive, Reston, Virginia, 22090, or call us at area code 703-435-0750. Welcome to the 58th National Model Airplane Championships, commonly known as NATS. This year, the championships were held in Reno, Nevada, August 5th through the 12th. In this issue of RC Video Magazine, we'll be looking at scale soaring. Smith and we're at the Soaring Nationals that are held every year all around the country. This particular airplane that we've got in front of us is a scale model of uh, ASW-20. It's a one-third replica of the real airplane and in the event it's uh, the object of the event is to fly not only to keep the airplane up for three and a half minutes but it's also judged on its appearance. This is uh, this event is normally held every year with the nationals all around the country, and it's one of the smaller events in soaring because of the complexity of building the airplanes as well as sometimes the difficulty in flying. model is made out of fiberglass. The, uh, the entire fuselage is fiberglass. The pilot is made out of rubber. The wings are uh, styrofoam on the inside. It has spars like a real airplane. It's covered with a beachy wood, which is a type of veneer they use in furniture. And the process for flying it is reasonably simple. You hook a, uh, a winch, a motor-powered winch, to the bottom of the airplane and when you give the winch power, it drags the airplane forward, giving it forward speed. You then rotate the airplane, 
and it's towed aloft just like you would a real airplane, and then upon release, you fly it with your radio to keep it up for three and a half minutes, and then you want to land it in the spot. Um, so the, the scores are then added up, the points you get for your scale documentation, as well as the appearance of the airplane, and also the um, flight performance with a landing in a spot, just like you would in a real airplane. competition we got uh, we did reasonably well we got first place in the flying and second place in the static judging which gave us a first place overall with 199 points out of 205 potential mark smith with looked like we had a real guy over here mark All right, today we're going to learn about using mylar markings. Now, this is something everybody does and very few people do right. Here's what it is. It's a little piece of uh, mylar plastic, and it's got a design on it that you want to take from here to the airplane. The problem is how to do it without fingerprints, without knife edges underneath it, and all kinds of silly things. Well, here's what to do. This is a piece of frisket paper. Now, you buy frisket paper at some hobby shops and at most any art supply store, and it's very much like the Mylar marking. It's a clear plastic sheet, and it's got a backing with some adhesive on it, and you just peel it away. I've already cut this to the proper size, which is just a little bit oversized of the Mylar marking we're going to put on. Now, the first step is to take an X-Acto knife with a clean, fresh number 11 blade. Don't use an old blade. It'll just make it worse and very carefully score around the mylar marking here. What we're going to do is remove everything from the backing sheet that we don't want on the wing. All this nonsense around the perimeter. Just don't need any of that. This is a sailplane anyway. It must be at least a tenth of a millionth of a gram over here, and that's got to cause you some drag. This works on power planes, too. Okay, the surgery's over. Get under the marking and peel away all this unwanted stuff. 
Comes right off real easy. Make sure when you do this that you don't get fingerprints on any of the good stuff in case it decides to come up with the other stuff. Okay. We've also got a little hole in here in between the gull and the bottom of the L. And let's get rid of some of that. Okay. Now this is ready to be applied to the wing. What you'd normally do is put a finger under there and lift it up and then take the other finger down and what you have is two fingerprints on either end. Or if you put a, an X-Acto knife under there as I did to get rid of this little piece, you'd have an X-Acto knife blade mark on the end. So what we're going to do is take the frisket paper and separate it from its backing sheet. You can put all the fingerprints you want on this, it won't hurt it. And we're going to lay the marking down on the backing sheet of the frisket paper and put the frisket down on top of the marking kind of like a sandwich. Working from the center out, we're going to spread the frisket all over the marking. Get it nice and tight onto it. Something very important just before we lay this on the wing. This is some dishwashing detergent and water mixed together. I use this as a plane cleaner. Uh, it works for sailplanes, power planes. If it cuts greasy pots, it'll clean the grease on your airplane. And unlike some of the ammonia-based things, it won't attack paint. If there are still some painters left out there, Clean the wing with two separate paper towels, or a dust-free cloth is even better. One to get up the bulk of it, and a second dry one to make sure everything is smooth and nice. Then go back to the marking, and we're going to lift the frisket off its backing sheet. And very carefully, we're going to remove the backing sheet from the mylar marking and you'll see that the marking is sticking to the frisket paper there. Now you can touch the frisket with your fingertips anywhere you like, but don't touch the mylar marking because that part will be stuck to the airplane. Line it up real nice. Place it down on top of the aircraft. And again, working from the center out, smooth it down in all directions. Just like that. Make sure you've got it done all over. And when it is, take the end of the frisket paper, peel it back, set it back on its backing sheet, and there you've got the marking all set, no wrinkles, no bubbles. No fingerprints. My name is John Simone, and we're here in California, right by the beach, right near our manufacturing facility in Oceanside, California. I am the president of American RC Helicopters, and before me is one of our helicopters known or called the Mantis. The helicopter, the Mantis, is one of our basic training helicopters that is used to train beginners into the first stages of helicopter flight. For all you fixed wing flyers out there, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a brief little summary here of what it's like to fly an RC helicopter so you can relate to the same basic fundamentals that you've been using in your fixed wing experience to try and help you understand how a helicopter flies and performs. And it's really not quite as difficult as a lot of you probably think it is. We do quite a few trade shows throughout the year, and a typical question is, hey, I fly RC airplanes. I don't know how high or how far these things fly, or what makes them tick. 
So if you can give me a little bit of an explanation of how it works out, I got five minutes. So our typical response is, well, number one, if you fly or presently fly airplanes now, you use the same basic equipment that you would use for your radio equipment is also used in the helicopters. Uh, if you fly mode one or mode two or single stick, depending on what mode you fly, that also holds true to helicopters. You basically take the same fundamentals you've learned from RC airplanes and you adapt them to RC helicopters. Most all helicopters in the market today are produced so that a beginner basically can take a helicopter from out of the box and produce it and assemble it and basically end up with the result that you will understand the fundamentals of how the machine is uh, assembled, how it's test flown, how it's maintained, and how to go about teaching yourself to learn to fly. In a brief summary, the helicopter responds and reacts similar to a fixed-wing aircraft in flight. Uh, your rudder is basically the same as it would be in an airplane, only it functions as the tail rotor control or counteracts the torque, which is created by the main rotor blades of its spinning motion. The roll or ailerons is the same in a helicopter as well, only in a hover, a right and left movement would be a right and left movement on the stick, which would be a roll in an airplane, which would be right and left in a hover or sideways motion. In forward flight, as if the helicopter was flying forward like an airplane, then it becomes roll. You move the stick right, the helicopter rolls or actually moves to the right as well in a rolling axis. The chair order becomes somewhat docile or not quite so sensitive in forward flight. So during forward flight procedures or maneuvers, you wouldn't have quite the response you would normally have in a fixed wing aircraft. It wouldn't yaw the airplane or the aircraft, so to speak, quite so much. Your forward and backward movement or your elevator movement is the same as an RC aircraft, also applies to a helicopter, in being that in a hover, the helicopter basically moves forward and backward by moving the stick forward and backward. In forward flight, again, with the machine moving forward, the fore and aft movement becomes forward or up and down. This actually will pitch the helicopter in a climbing attitude or a descending attitude, depending on how much deflection you would give the stick. The throttle is the same as it would be in an RC aircraft. The more engine, the more throttle, the more engine speed, the more rotor RPM. The more rotor RPM we achieve, the more control we achieve, as well as the more vertical altitude we will be achieving. This machine in front of me is collective pitch. And as well as increasing the rotor RPM, we also increase and decrease the rotor pitch, or the pitch of the main rotor blades. This also assists or gives you the basic means of vertical motion. Having this company has afforded me a lot of privileges that I probably wouldn't have had as a basic Sunday flyer. And one of those is being able to fly and perform in motion pictures. You may have seen some of the pictures I performed in. Um, recently, Blue Thunder, Firefox, Final Countdown, Swarm, Proof of the Wild. Those are a few that I've worked on throughout the, the last three or four years that um, have been a real challenge and also a quite unique experience. It's taken me to a lot of different locations throughout the world that I wouldn't be able to go to had I didn't do the movie work. The nice thing about this movie work is that it affords me an opportunity to go out and enjoy my hobby that is still a hobby, although it's a business, and have fun doing it and meet the stars 
and actually be a part of a full-length motion picture production. Building an arsenal of 15 miniatures for Blue Thunder was quite a challenge. It took about eight and a half months of work. Several people working on these miniatures, making molds, assembling, painting, pre-flighting, and actual flight testing all of the miniatures. Took quite some time. What you're now seeing on the screen is footage from Blue Thunder. To close, I'd like to say thank you for joining me these last few minutes. Here in the beach in California, I think I'll uh, whip off my shirt and put the suit on and go for a dive here in a few minutes. In the meantime, I want to wish you happy flying, whatever you're flying, whether it be boats, cars, planes, choppers, whatever. It's been nice talking to you, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. To back up a sophisticated aircraft like this, you need a company with the highest standards of engineering. Mastercraft machinists, full inventory, distribution, and a staff that understands your needs. American Helicopters has been building quality helicopters since 1976, satisfying the demanding needs of Hollywood special effects. They've built and flown models for over two dozen films, including Blue Thunder and Firefox. American Helicopters has developed a full line of aircraft that can take you beyond the edge of competition. In future issues, Doug Pratt will discuss the rotary valve four-stroke engine, the HP, and the Webra. We'll cover the scale Masters finals in Kansas City, Missouri. And we'll be going back to the 1984 Model Airplane Championships in Reno, Nevada. Just a few of the exciting RC stories coming to you in future editions of RC Video Magazine. If you have an idea for a story in RC Video Magazine, write to us at 741 17th Street, Boulder, Colorado, 80302. If you would like a year's subscription to RC Video Magazine, send $90 to 741 17th Street, Boulder, Colorado, 80302. MasterCard or Visa orders are welcome. Phone 303-443-7170.